Welcome to Inventing Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Brittany Zimmerman. And I'm your co-host, Richard Hanna. Today, we are going to, a, just going to do a deep dive into dirt. So joining us, we have two guests. We have Mike Von Fonsdok and John Webster. Welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, uh, Brittany and Richard. Uh, glad to be here. Yeah, Mike, you know, um, Brittany and I last week, we visited some mulch and compost operations. It was a mind-blowing experience for me, I got to tell you. So, but anyway, I, I, I just wanted to introduce you. Um, go, go ahead and tell us about yourself and what you do. I work at the uh, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command Office of Science Technology. And what we do is uh, look at technologies and how technologies can improve uh, the uh, preparedness and readiness of our warfighters and also the community in which we uh, operate and live. And one of my portfolios is environment and uh, sustainment. So my background is uh, I'm a retired officer in the Army, but also uh, worked for uh, over 30 years now with the Battelle Memorial Institute out of Columbus. I'm seconded from there to support the Indo-Pacific Command since 2011. And uh, my graduate work was on uh, industrial scale composting and ex situ soil remediation using uh, bioprocessing. So, uh, developed a high rate in vessel composting for uh, optimizing the economics and quality of compost, and then applied compost technology to remediate explosives contaminated soil and uh, also uh, hydrocarbon contaminated soil. And how do we do that cost effectively? And uh, environmentally uh, friendly in an environmentally friendly manner and uh, did a lot of compost uh, research at Ohio State University where I got my master's and PhD. Thank you Mike. I think uh, you probably know a thing or two about soils and dirt then so <laughs> yeah, and the <laughs> difference and the difference between the two. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> awesome and, and welcome John. Um, I'm excited to have you with us. Uh, also, could you give us a brief introduction and background of yourself? Yeah, sh sure thing. Happy to. Uh, it's glad to be here with the heavy hitter, Mike. Uh, nice to meet you. And Richard, good to see you again. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, my name is John Webster. I'm with the U.S. Biochar Initiative. I am the Director of Communications. I also am a biochar producer. I have a facility in Salt Lake City, Utah that I've been operating for up to just about two and a half years now. Um, I was previously in the tech sector and then uh, moved into the environmental space and I, I found quite a niche with uh, biochar. So uh, the, the U.S. Biochar Initiative is committed to advancing the sustainable use and production of biochar through science, implementation, studies, practices, and, uh, and, and now we're working on communications with out, outreach and education. So I'm really pleased to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Um, we're really happy to have you here also. So just taking it at a super high level and then drilling ourselves down. Um, maybe Mike, you kind of cued us up. What is the difference between soil and dirt? Well, so, so dirt is uh, mainly the dust and the inorganic material that is found around on a, and it's, it's not the whole matrix of soil. So it's just the dust you see, the, the soil, uh, the inorganic material, uh, silicates, et cetera, that, that are in in the soil, in the topsoil, but they're not the soil. The soil itself is a whole uh, ecosystem. It's a three-phase ecosystem that consists of, of uh, minerals, the, the, the geologic mineral mineralogy, uh, the dust of which becomes the dirt, or and then um, inclusive of that is the whole bio uh, mass the bacteria and the uh, fungi even the microorganisms and even the small insects that are in the soil and all that uh, is ma matrix with a humic material that is organic matter which is about two to three percent of the soil but it's very important because it provides a lot of uh, uh, opportunity for plants to pull in nutrients for roots to find security for bacteria to be healthy and for healthy bacteria, fungi, actinomyces to outcompete uh, uh, pathogens, plant pathogens. So 
Uh, mm -hmm. so that's kind of a short rundown. And don't forget the water, the moisture, and the gases that are in the in the in the soil matrix as well. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so now we understand a little bit of a uh, difference in our vocabulary, right, between uh, soil and dirt. We've seen a lot, uh, I would say, recently in terms of discussions around fertilizers, soil amendment products, and things along those lines. Um, uh, is soil amendment something that's been done, you know, in all of human history? Is this something rather new? Uh, what's kind of the climate of amending soil and how has that changed over time? I'm happy to jump on that a little bit. I mean, the plow was invented just a little over 2000 years ago. Um, so, and since then we've been farming the soil carbon, right? So, um, and then with that, uh, we've had a number of soil health practices that include things like uh, agricultural charcoal. There are some cultures that utilize charcoal, and um, there's evidence of nine different indigenous groups utilizing agri uh, charcoal or biochar, as we're calling it these days, for um, growing healthier crops and, con and controlling their environment a little bit more uh, responsibly, you know, growing food makes for a more organized civilization. With the invention of new technologies, we've got a way to create this charcoal in a more sensible manner. Um, I guess in terms of the history of addendums, uh, you know, manure has been our number one input as we've domesticated animals. Uh, we incorporate that, it, their manures into our soils. Uh, in order to grow healthier crops. Uh, that means we're doing a number of things, right? We're farming the microbes that come from the, the, the intestines of the animals. And then we're also utilizing the organic material that they started to break down for us. Wonderful. So if we have all these new ways of doing uh, soil amendments, does that mean, is it fair to say, or um, is it true? Um, has soils over, you know, the last thousand, two thousand years, are they getting healthier or are they becoming more depleted? Uh, so I'll jump on that. So with the advent of artificial of chemical fertilizers and uh, industrial scale farming, there was a, a, you know, the miracle revolution to feed the world of the, you know, 20th century was truly a miracle in, in being able to help uh, provide food for billions of people. Um, but and the the sufferer was soil. Soil suffered because chemical fertilizers were applied. We had a monoculture of, of, of crops, monocrop uh, of mentality, and that robbed the soil of the, of the organic matter. And uh, the biggest uh, result of that was a dust bowl in the 1930s, as, as you know, people know and saw in history. So they started, so people started learning. We started uh, USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture started uh, extension centers to say, hey, we should, you know, rotate crops and they started doing that and we started minimizing things we started doing things better but we still relied heavily on chemical fertilizers and it, it didn't really regrow the organic matter so one thing that composting can do is, is really provide a lot of uh, good organic matter back to the soil to promote uh, that healthy uh, e ecosystem for plant between plants and, and microbes and uh, nematodes etc so uh, you know we really didn't improve our soil uh, through the 20th century miracle of, of farming and farming uh, um, techniques, but we're, we, we learned lessons and are, are working things like no-till, using organic farming, et cetera, to recover and being able to have high intensity farming at the same time, try to preserve our topsoil. So um, erosion is a big thing too. So we gotta watch that. Yeah, and it's been nice to see the move into the uh, regenerative agriculture space uh, with the conservation tillage that you're talking about, incorporating um, sound practices, water management, animal management on some of the land. I do, I do think uh, one of the more interesting things is how um, now that we've come to realize that the tillage exposes all that carbon to volatize and go up into our atmosphere that we're, uh, paying attention to that, and we're and, and we're taking the time to focus on rebuilding those stores. Effectively, we've kind of we wrote a lot of checks on that bank account, and we've somewhat depleted it. Uh, a lot of other soils throughout the United States are, in in frankly, they're in desperate condition. So, uh, I've been extremely pleased to see the actions that the USDA and RCS are taking in order to rebuild 
the soil carbon through sensible programs like the code 336, which um, literally will uh, pay farmers to install materials like compost, mulch, and biochar into their soils. Not only does it pay for the material, it also pays for the installation and some transport for it. So we do have a really nice, strong focus on rebuilding um, the soil store, uh, the, the soil carbon, building up that biology and, and bringing crop productivity back to a less input for more yield mentality. So it's pretty exciting. If we're using uh, uh, compost, mulching, and those things to, to get the soil in better shape, uh, are we, is that making a difference immediately? Would it last for any length of time? How much do we have to do it? Are we that far behind? Or, you know, I, I'm just wondering how much effort is it going to take for us to uh, get in better shape than we are? So, it's Mike, so the uh, deficit has to be paid back. So you have to build up the organic matter and apply heavier applications. And the thing about compost versus a chemical fertilizer is you're not, you don't have to worry about the runoff. So, or even raw manure, when you apply raw manure, like a chicken manure, a hog manure, you have to be careful about your NPK loading because if you overload in phosphates and, and uh, potassium, that runs into the watershed and it creates secondary bad problems for your water quality. So you have to manage your nutrient load and applying a, a compost material uh, and compost in combination with a biochar will um, prevent that overloading and at the same time provide you some residual NPK and um, the organic matter will build up and then in successive years you can cut back and then if you have then you have an annual or even a biannual or semi-annual, excuse me, semi-annual maintenance application that the farmers would would apply, and that tonnage per acre uh, of material to add is a function of the soil type, the level of depletion that's experienced, and even the crops that you want to grow. But but the general uh, application would be the same thing: make up and then sustain over. Yeah. And Richard, I have a little bit of information for you there. Uh, I've worked with some landowners that what they're doing, you know, they started out the, a number of years ago when you were talking about land management and the, you were talking about a chemical program, right? The soil health managers, they were telling you, they were advising you, here's the inputs you need, here's your chemicals, here's when to play, apply something that ends in aside, pesticide, herbicide, fertilizer. Um, and nowadays, again, with the uh, conservation practices, the low-till or no-till practices, we're not releasing the carbon so quickly. And so, uh, like Mike pointed out, as you manage your nutrition, you include your things like compost and your no-till practices, we are seeing soil carbon reserves build rather quickly. Somebody I work with a little bit down south here in Utah, where I'm located, uh, uh, just a little over five years ago, their soil carbon content was sitting just under 2%. Five years later, no-till, careful management, and they're now sitting at 4.5%. So that's a fairly quick, um, in, in, in geologic timescales, it's amazingly fast, right? We didn't think that was really possible. We, weren't, we, didn't, really, we didn't have the knowledge that we have now. Uh, in the past, we're like, oh, it's going to take a thousand years to build 1% of soil carbon. And we now know that that's not true. Responsible, sane practices build carbon in a quick manner. And, th and that's why people are so interested in this field. Um, one of the things I do want to point out is that when we're talking about loading of those nutrients, the benefit that biochar has, and I'm going to show real quick on the screen, um, this is what the porosity looks like for the biochar. You can see it's, it looks a lot like a petrified sponge. Well, all those little nooks and crannies are high-rise condos for all the beneficial microbes and bacteria that Mike was talking about earlier. And the other thing that it has is it has an attraction. So as a lot of our materials are coming in and they tend to be positively charged ions. So we have the cation exchange and anions. And, but anyway, as these, uh, inputs come in, including water, they form a temporary bond in most cases. Uh, so when they meet that biochar, they stick there for a period of time. And what's nice is when you, you have that in the soil subsurface, 
that means you have a longer duration value for your water, a longer duration value for your NPK, whether it's an organic source or even a synthetic source. So the longer we can hold on to those nutrients, the longer we can provide a beneficial environment, the more chance we give to that biology in the soil to survive and thrive and do what they do. It's, the, it's literally their bodies and their outputs that are building the soil aggregates. It's really a dynamic and beautiful environment down there. I mean, if you're a good gardener, you're an amazing micro brancher. That's a simple truth. Is those Mike also on the, expand on the cation exchange capacity that that's a really important factor uh, to uh, consider with respect to um, nutrient retention. So you you um, if you apply strict chemical fertilizer and and you certainly there's a place for chemical fertilizer, it's, it's important. Uh, but if if you apply strict chemical fertilizer in this just into the regular soil, like a clay soil, most of it washes away and the phosphates stick because it doesn't travel very far and it absorbs but it holds tightly to the soil doesn't release if it hits a biochar then you have more of a cation exchange capacity uh, so the facilitation of, of of an equilibrium dynamic of the phosphate being able to be absorbed by the plants is, is better so you don't you to two benefits are one you don't need as much for chemical fertilizer and two you you don't wash away as much so it's it's a a two for one win. It's actually a three for one win because it also creates that healthy dynamic that that John was was mentioning. So compost has a similar benefit of cation exchange capacity. It's a different mechanism. It's a more organic matrix. And one of the highlights I, I want to mention about compost is that there's um, uh, if you want to do composting in your in your um, backyard, there's basic phases, there's, a, there's an initial lag. First, you want to balance out your carbon nitrogen ratio, get your moisture content about 50% or so. And then uh, it takes a little bit of a lag time. Then the temperature builds up as the microbes start working up the or get readily or get degradable materials, hit the ex exothermic phase and rapidly will elevate in temperature. And then once the, those uh, readily dynamic, uh, readily absorbed degradable materials are consumed by the bacteria, it'll level off in temperature, and then you enter your curing phase. So you go from a high rate bacterial phase to a steady to lower rate of mineralization and humification through the actinomyces and fungi. So that's, um, I just wanted to highlight that for the backyard gardeners that, that want to know about composting. So you need to be able to have a way of, of getting the higher temperature and then letting it cure out. And then once it cures out and the oxygen use rate goes down and you start building that humic fraction, now you're getting a mature compost. And that mature compost is the good compost that you want to apply in your yard and your container media. Yes, absolutely. And, and if you'll allow me, one of the things I want to point out is that when you add a material like biochar to your compost, uh, you reduce a lot of the valorization. So instead of having your nutrients go up into the atmosphere, CO2, uh, they retain in the compost pile. The other thing is that biochar is uh, this beautiful black color. So um, you can see here, I'm holding it up on the screen. It's dark, just like the charcoal that you're used to in, in some of your fire pits. Um, that color in your composting can help accelerate the process. Plus, the build, and it also increases the microbial communities as well. So there are studies that show that adding as little as 10% by volume or biochar to your compost pile can accelerate the maturation process by as much as 20%. Uh, it increases the, the amount of uh, sun energy that's captured, reduces the nutrient loss, and improves the overall uh, microbial community. So it's really kind of a win-win for the organics recycling and composting community. And it provides a, a porosity for the air exchange uh, a good porosity value for healthy compost is about 40%. And um, a lot of times in industrial composting that are static pile or windrow driven, you had a bulking agent like wood chips. Well, wood chips don't, they'll, they'll stay, they're very high lignin, they'll stay in there. So when you, for container media, you have to separate that out. But if you have a biochar, you can just incorporate that, blend it in, and it's part of your container media as a healthy matrix. Yeah, it also keeps the odors down, which is really, the neighbors really appreciate that. <laughs> and there's something about it when you get that rich, dark earth and the compost and the biochar together and you put it in your hands. Mm -hmm. Oh man, there's nothing like it. And when you see what it does for your plants, it's really amazing. It smells like you're in the woods. 
Oh, isn't that great? It really is. <laughs> you know, I've got a question. Um, out here on Amokokos, there's a bunch of uh, sweet potatoes being grown. So they till the soil, and they plant it, and then they harvest, and they let it rest for a while. Then they plow all the regrow mm -hmm. weeds and whatever grows up back into the soil. Is it possible for them to accelerate that process using uh, compost and biochar to, to make that period shorter so that they can rotate the crop faster? It's configurable, right? You have a lot of options between both the biochar and the compost. It depends on what your resource concerns are. Are you addressing the biology? Are you addressing water holding capacity? Are you addressing something uh, something else? Uh, it again um it 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 just takes a little know-how and time in order to put things together build build a suitable program uh the nrcs is there to help you help you uh along the way for a lot of your growers uh mike I, i'm afraid i may have cut you off did you have something you wanted to say about that i was just going to say that if you it, if you you can do things you could do depending on how the top or the residual step or organic material the leaves or whatever you can either if you if you harvested those and, and composted those you could within short order put that right back in as a as an immature comp and you could really uh it depends how how easily you could uh, recover all the green material put it into a in vessel system and i could turn it around and like within a week put it back on as a as a as a raw compost and that could really accelerate your uh, crop turn that's one option. The other option is you could blend in some biochar with some mature compost, and that, that'll give you some acceleration. So, Richard, it sounds like it can work. It's just an issue of getting, maybe giving it a little trial. So if you've got a few hundred acres that you're farming, maybe try this on five to ten acres and, and, and see, what, see what hits the best for you on your production. I was going to say time is money, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yes, it is. Could... Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, say, and water and water and honestly water is money and fertilizer is money and compost is money and biochar is money so when we can figure out how to get them all to work together uh and optimize the performance then it, that's really fantastic uh, well, one thing i wanted to highlight just off of that and richard's last question is high intensity right so in the island nations food getting food to an island getting if you can more food you can grow yourselves the more sustainable resilient you become and limited acreage, you want to be able to have more crop turn or greenhouse production. So using biochar compost in, in tandem could really help you get that higher uh, intensity, higher yield uh, dynamic going for your agriculture, local agriculture. So what I'm hearing a lot of, right, is how the interactions are occurring between compost and mulch and biochar. You know, I think one of the things we hear about is, oh, should I apply compost or should I apply mulch or should I apply bi biochar? What I think you guys are here to say is that, you know, that those things are are not, you know, in competition with one another, but they're actually synergistic. So it's a combination of all of these things working together that really highlights the best version of our soils. Am I understanding that correct? I believe yeah. so. Yes, but I'd also like to highlight that, uh, uh, an unscreened compost can make a really good uh, top dressing uh, instead of a mulch uh, because you can, um, it doesn't just, you don't have to rake it off after it, 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 it absorbs in the soil over time and um, it still provides you that, uh, that top cover you need to, to suppress some of the weeds growing in, but it won't uh, rob the soil, the soil of nitrogen like a, a, a mulch will. Right. And then and then for something like biochar, you don't want to put that on top. We want to get that down into the rhizosphere where the roots mm -hmm. are. We want it down in here. So if we were going to practice that uh, uh, young compost as a as a mulch practice, we'd put the we put a layer of biochar down first. And then that way, the biochar gets all power packed mm -hmm. with those nutrients as they work their way through. Uh, and then as the biochar itself works its way down into the soil layers, then um, it's kind of again, it's a win win. And again, um, it is all about addressing the resource concerns. So uh, working with your certified crop assistants is always a good idea. Your local agronomist uh, should be able to give you some input as well. You know, biochar is the new kid on the block. So um, 
there have been some studies going on uh, in on the islands for a number of years now, um, but again, not not everybody knows about it. It's um, uh, it, it is extremely well studied with the science, just like compost is. Uh, it just doesn't have the the popular adoption, and and it still, frankly, is a little bit of a, a price point. Uh, we are seeing more producers come online. So as that as that's been coming on online, we're seeing the price go down for uh, purchasing the biochar, and it's and it's increasing adoption overall. So it's very exciting um, it, way to bring it, balance. Both biochar and compost can also have another benefit, and that is to extend the life of landfills. The landfills have a purpose, but putting organic material into landfills is not a great idea because they're high volume, low weight, and also create a lot of uh, methane problems down the line. So if we could source, separate, and divert organic materials out of a landfill into composting in the same producing biochar, that'll have economic benefits and environmental benefits. It's a wonderful virtuous cycle. Uh, we're also finding that biochar incorporation into animal management practices, besides uh, greatly reducing the odor, is also reducing a lot of the methane output. So, um, you know, methane is a little bit more of a concern than CO2. Uh, CO2, we sure have a lot of, but uh, again, it's all about finding balance and that I really uh, i am happy you brought up that restoration. Wonderful. Yeah, I want to say thank you first and foremost. Um, I'm really excited about uh, diving deeper in. Uh, I think in some of our upcoming letters, we'll do a super deep dive into both composts, uh, mulches, biochars, and other soil amendment practices. So wanted to say thank you guys for giving us that, uh, you know, 50,000 foot view of how these things start coming together. And we really appreciate that. So uh, as we wrap up, was there any uh, last um, informative bits, uh, Mike or John, that you'd like to throw at us before we sign off? No, uh, just this Mike, just thinking that uh, there's opportunities for expanding uh, the application of uh, both backyard and industrial commercial scale composting in the islands, and I would look to see uh, how we could uh, collaborate and make that happen. Uh, yeah, and I would like to add that, you know, biochar is ancient earth wisdom. We're just, uh, the good news is we have a way to do it with much lower emissions these days. We can really control the type of biochar that you're going to get, uh, making it suitable for purpose. Uh, it's a tremendous opportunity to reduce greenhouse gases, grow big crops with less inputs. And one last request would be that you go to our website, if possible, at biochar-us.org and sign up for our newsletter. We've got a monthly newsletter that contains a lot of very useful information about biochar and the latest news. So, and Brittany and Richard, thank you so much for, for having us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you guys. Oh man, I'm alive. This is, I'm all excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> a lot Likewise. of fun. <laughs> thank you get, guys. Get out there. Yeah, get out there and garden. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Uh, wrapping up then, uh, this is Inventing Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. I want to thank you again, Mike and John, for joining us. Uh, and thanks, of course, to our viewers for watching. If you want to get our email advisories or to see a complete listing of all of the shows, you can sign up for them on thinktechhawaii.com. But we will be back in two weeks. So please tune in and we will do a deep dive into our e-invention. Until then, I'm Brittany Zimmer. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo.